All right, so let's get started. Uh, welcome everyone uh, to this lecture. So I will uh, give a lecture on IPEPS, which is the method I've been working on now for a couple of years. So I have a mostly a computational physics background, so my main interest is to use IPEPS and apply it uh, for challenging 2D strongly correlated systems. So I'm interested in applications, but then of course also in the further development of the method such that we can push it to higher and higher accuracy. Okay, so this lecture will be about a practical introduction to HyPEPS, so the onsets, but then also the involved uh, methods. And I will also give you some practical advice, what you can do if you want to get started, uh, when you want to try to implement your own 2D tensor network uh, algorithm. Okay, so you already heard a lot about uh, DMRG and uh, matrix product states uh, during this workshop. And uh, you know that this has really we can say it has revolutionized the simulation of one-dimensional systems. And you might also have heard uh, that there are other tensor networks in one dimension, like the MIRA, uh, the multi-scale entanglement randomization ensembles, which is a particular powerful ensemble for critical systems. And then there are the two-dimensional extensions of these 1D tensor networks. So like the HEPs or TPS is a generalization of the MPS, and then there's also this uh, 2D MIRA. Now, in the end, the goal of these 2D tensor networks is, of course, to repeat this enormous success of DMRG with a tensor network that is specially designed for 2D systems. But already from the picture, you can see that uh, these networks are more complicated in 2D than in 1D, which unfortunately also implies that the involved algorithms are far more complicated than in 1D. And that's, in the end, one of the main reasons why it actually took several years to get these methods really um, kind of efficient and get, uh, uh, get very competitive results out of them. But there has been really a lot of progress in recent years and there have, been, there have become very powerful methods. Okay, so I will, uh, in this lecture, I will also show you some applications to actually illustrate you wh where we currently are with these methods, so what you can do with them and how they compare uh, with other methods. Okay, so that's the outline of the two lectures, so today and tomorrow. And uh, today we're going to start with the IPEPS ansatz. So I guess this is uh, mostly repetition, so I will also briefly mention the error law of the entanglement entropy again and show that the PEPS and IPEPS uh, fulfill an error law. And then the main part today will be about the contraction methods for PEPS and IPEPS. So I will. Uh, give you an overview of different contraction methods but then mostly focus on the corner transfer matrix method which is also the one I'm mostly using and also explain uh, extensions so how you can use this if you have for example large uh, size unit cells in your own cells and so on. And then I will also use some time to uh, go through some simple examples that I find useful if you want to get started and implement something on your own. And uh, so it turns out if you, for example, implement uh, a CTM for the 2D classical easing model, that this is a very simple code uh, which you can do essentially in a few lines. So that's a very good starting point. And uh, you can try this on your own, and it will also provide you some uh, example codes that you can study if you want to uh, try this out. And then the interesting thing is that if you have this code, you can then also uh, do a simple 2D quantum case just by some modifications of your code. And that's, I think it's a nice, simple example if you want to try out a, a quantum problem in 2D. Then is, if there's time, we'll also go uh, through some example application here, which is the shastri sutherland model. So that's the plan for today. And tomorrow, we will focus on the optimization uh, in IPEPS. We'll talk about the computational cost and the benchmarks. And then I'll also show you comparison with the uh, DMRG some more applications and then uh, maybe also about the uh, fermions in 2D tensor networks. So that's the plan. So this is a lecture, so please uh, interrupt me at any time if I uh, can clarify things. So that's, uh, that's how it should be. Okay, so let me start with the IPEPS ansatz. And just very general, as you know, we're interested in ground states of local Hamiltonians, which are really special. So if this is your entire Hilbert space, then we are interested in this small corner of the Hilbert space. And what makes these states really special is that they're really much less entangled than the random state in your Hilbert space. 
and that's expressed in this well-known area law of the entanglement entropy. Right? So I guess you know how it can be computed. Right? So let's look at the region A in the system here of length L in 1D. And here we have a, a block A in 2D with side length L. And then you know that the entanglement entropy can be computed as uh, minus trace rho A log rho A, where rho A is the reduced density matrix of this region A. And the lambda I are the eigenvalues of the reduced density matrix. OK, one can also say that uh, if you look at such a region here and ask the question, how many states do you need to describe uh, do you need to have to describe this region, then this number of relevant states will grow exponentially with the entanglement entropy. Okay? And then, uh, so if you pick just a general random state out from a Hilbert space, then you get this volume law here, so it will scale as L to the power of D, where D is the spatial dimension of your system, but if you take ground states of local Hamiltonians, then these typically obey uh, this area law, meaning that the entanglement entropy is proportional to the area of this boundary here between A and the rest of the system. And now this implies in one dimension, so take L to the power of 1 minus 1, so that's a constant, right? So the entanglement entropy will asymptotically be, become a constant when you go to look, uh, larger and larger systems. And then the remarkable consequence then is that the number of states which are needed to describe such a region A in your system also becomes a constant. And that's in it very remarkable that you can represent uh, such a region here with a finite number of states even though the Hilbert space is growing exponentially. And, so, and in the end, this is really the reason why DMRG is so uh, powerful. Now, in two dimensions, it means that the entanglement entropy is proportional to L, so the, the length uh, of the boundary of this block, and we will come back to this uh, later on. So the number of states then is also reduced, so it's instead of being exponential in L squared, it's just exponential in, in L. Now, of course, there are exceptions to this uh, area law, so there are uh, critical ground states which violate the area law, so in one dimension, all critical ground states have this log L correction to the area law. In two dimensions, there are critical ground states which have a log L correction, but not all of them. And actually, we heard that already yesterday in, in Lucas' talk. OK, so this is a, a violation of the area law, but in the end, it's still a mild violation compared to this volume law here. And typically, we can still use tensor network methods also in, in these cases. And there are also special tensor networks like the mirror or the branching mirror, which can actually reproduce uh, this entanglement scaling. Right, so the main idea of a tensor network then in the end is that it's not necessarily good answers for any state in your Hilbert space, but it is designed in such a way that it can reproduce a certain entanglement scaling. Right? So a matrix product state can reproduce this uh, area law in one dimension. We will see that the PEPs can reproduce this uh, area law in two dimensions. And then there are other special tensor network like the MIRA, which can reproduce this log L, or the branching MIRA can reproduce an L log L. Okay, so you can somehow classify uh, different tensor networks according to the entanglement entropy they can uh, reproduce. Okay, so let me just in the following show you kind of the difference between NPS and PEPs in terms of what kind of entanglement they can reproduce. Okay, so here we have just a simple matrix product state and you can easily convince yourself that the NPS can reproduce an area law, right? Because if you cut your system into two parts here and then you have a region A here with length L, then you can convince yourself that the uh, rank of the reduced density matrix on this side is bounded by D, so the bond dimension uh, connecting the left side and the right side. Right? So in the end, the bond dimension itself limits the number of non-zero eigenvalues <coughs> your reduced density matrix can have. And if you have at most D uh, eigenvalues, finite eigenvalues, then you can have at most uh, log D entanglement entropy. That's the maximal entanglement entropy you can obtain if uh, 
if you just have the eigenvalues here, and if they're all equal, then you get this uh, maximally entangled state. Okay, but now this is, this is a scaling depending on D, but not on L, so that's a constant in L, right? So it does not depend on L. So that's exactly the area law in one dimension. Okay, so the message here to remember is that whenever you cut a bond here in your network, this bond can at most contribute log D to the entanglement entropy. Okay, so we'll come back to this uh, in a minute. Now, early on, people wanted to use MPS also for two-dimensional systems, and as you probably know, you can put a matrix product state with such a snake here on a two-dimensional lattice, and you can do this. I mean, essentially, it boils down to mapping the two-dimensional system onto a one-dimensional system with long-range interactions, right? Because a local interaction between these two sides here becomes a long-range interaction in the MPS language. And then we can see what happens now if we split the system into two <coughs> pieces. Then we can again ask the question, so how does the entanglement entropy grow as a function of this L here? And then if we have an area law, we know that the entanglement entropy will grow linearly with this cut length here. Right? And as a consequence, the number of relevant states that you need to keep will grow exponentially with this cut length here. Right? So the D here that you need to keep will grow exponentially with this length L. And this result is, is quite intuitive because imagine if you let the system grow in this direction, then of course the entanglement entropy between its left side and the right side will grow very naturally. But then the whole entanglement entropy is only, uh, the whole entanglement is only carried by this single bond here. So when we increase the system size, then we naturally have to increase also the bond dimension. Okay, so this means that this approach will fail if you go to large systems. But of course, it doesn't mean that you can't use it for 2D systems. I mean, there have been many very impressive calculations with 2D DMRG. So if this length here is not too large, um, but by not too large, I mean maybe up to 10 lattice sides, depending on the problem, then you can, can get very accurate results uh, with this approach. And then you see that many people also use cylinders to do their simulation, so long cylinders, because this exponential scaling only appears in this length here, but not in the horizontal length. Okay, so that's why people can use long cylinders and then just get this exponential scaling in this length here. Okay, so this, um, you can get information about 2D physics uh, from this ansatz, but if you really want to go to large 2D systems, this approach will fail because of this exponential scaling. And now the solution to this is, is very simple, right? So we said the problem here is that we only have one single bond which connects the left side with the right side. So the solution is simply to add more bonds connecting the two sides. And this uh, leads us to uh, PEPS, so Project and Entangled Pair State, or also called a Tensor Product State. Right? And you see this can really be seen as a very natural extension of an NPS two dimensions because we also have exactly one tensor per lattice site and each tensor is connected to its four nearest neighbors by four auxiliary bonds. So it's really a very natural generalization to 2D. And we can now easily show that this uh, HEPS fulfills an area law in two dimensions. And why is that? So if we again do a cut of our system here, then it turns out that now we don't cut only one single bond, but we actually cut L bonds here. So you can think of this L bonds here <coughs> as being one big index with bond dimension D to the power of L, right? Because here we have bond dimension D, here another D, so it's D times D times D times D, so it's, that's D to the power of L. Or you can also think of just contracting this entire network here on the left side, resulting in this tensor here, and contracting this part here, resulting in tensor B. So it's essentially an MPS with this thick bond in between of D to the power of L. And then you can again ask the question, what is the maximal entanglement entropy you can have between this side and this side? So it's log D to the power of L, which is L log D. 
And you see this is proportional to L. And that's exactly an area law in two dimensions. Okay. Or in other words, as we mentioned before, whenever you cut a bond, this can contribute at most log D to your entanglement entropy. And here the trick is that the number of bonds you cut is exactly given by the length that you cut. So this reproduces an area law in 2D in a very natural way. Okay, so now this, what is shown here, is a PEPS uh, for a finite 2D wave function with open boundary conditions, but we will uh, mostly focus on the infinite version, uh, so-called IPEPS, um, with which you can represent the 2D wave function <coughs> directly in the thermodynamic limit. Okay, so if, uh, and of course there's a, a similar ansatz also in 1D, so you can also have an infinite uh, matrix product state. And of course the nice feature of this ansatz is that there's no finite size uh, and boundary effects, uh, which is one of the problems if you do, for example, 2D DMRG on cylinders. Now, if your uh, wave function is <coughs> translation invariance, then you can parametrize your wave function simply by one tensor here, which is uh, repeated everywhere in the ansatz. But as already mentioned yesterday in my talk, uh, Typically, we need a larger unit cell because we can have translational symmetry breaking in the thermodynamic limit. So that's why typically we would use an ansatz, for example, here with AB. So imagine if you have a nil state with anti-ferromagnetic order, then we would need such an AB ansatz uh, with one tensor for each sublattice. Okay. And more generally, uh, you can use a certain unit cell which is periodically repeated. So here we have a unit cell of uh, four times two tensors, right? So with eight different tensors, and these are kind of repeated uh, over and over in your ansatz. Right? And as uh, mentioned yesterday with the examples for the Hubbard model, you can actually use uh, different unit cell sizes, and this may give you different uh, competing ground states and then by checking the variational energies, eventually you can then say which of these uh, candidate states is the, true, is the true ground state. Okay, so this is kind of the uh, IPEPS ansatz, which in the end has two free parameters. One is kind of the, the unit cell size, and the other one is the, is the bond dimension. Okay, so again, in practice, we'll just try out different unit cell sizes and then see um, what, uh, which unit cell gives the lowest variational energy. <coughs> okay, so um, we have discussed uh, the ansatz, right? Of, <coughs> as mentioned before, there are also different tensor network uh, onsets. Uh, and now um, we're also going to discuss about the actual algorithms, right? And we're going to talk about uh, ground state algorithms. So essentially there are uh, three steps, right? You start from some ansatz, which is a variational ansatz, so it will always give you an upper bound to the true ground state energy. And then the next step is to actually find uh, the best variational parameters so that you have the best approximation to the ground state of some given Hamiltonian. And most commonly this is done by doing some sort of energy minimization like in DMRG or by doing an imaginary time evolution. And I will go more into the details of these methods in the lecture tomorrow. And then finally, once you have uh, found the best state, you want to compute observables from that state. So like uh, the energy or correlation functions, or maybe entanglement entropies and so on. And for this, you have to contract the network, right? The, the tensor network representing this expectation value. And this contraction of the tensor network can be done in an exact way uh, for matrix product states and also for the mirror. But for PEPs and IPEPs, it can only be done in an approximate way. Right? That's kind of one of the main topics which we're going to discuss uh, in the lecture today. Okay, so let me come to this contraction part and just some very basic things to start with. So uh, how we can actually contract the tensor network. So here's an example from the uh, 1D mirror. It doesn't really matter what it represents. But imagine we want to contract this and the way we do this is, is by a 
uh, pairwise multiplication of, uh, of tensors. So for example, we can start with two, uh, these two tensors here and then multiply them together resulting in this tensor and then you can take the next two, multiply them and get this tensor and so on. Right? And then you can go on until the whole network is contracted right? and resulting in this, in this tensor here. And what is now very important to understand is that the order of contraction, so the sequence you choose of these pairwise multiplication will really matter for the computational cost. So whenever you contract, contract such a network, it's really important that you find out which pairwise sequence of pairwise multiplication actually gives the lowest uh, computational cost. And um, how can you actually do such a multiplication of two tensors? So right, imagine if you want to multiply A to B, this involves a, a five-fold sum, right? So we sum over I and J, but then do this for all values of U, V, and W. So we could write down a five-fold for loop to contract this network, but that's of course not uh, very efficient. So what is better to do is to actually reshape these tensors into matrices. So we can always combine this U and V index into one big index here of dimension D squared. And also this IJ here, we can combine the one thick index and then you see down here, we simply have a matrix-matrix multiplication. And for that, there exist really powerful uh, Fortran libraries, which you can use to do this matrix-matrix multiplication. You obtain a resulting tensor here. And then you just have to uh, reshape this tensor back into a three-leg tensor. And that's how you get uh, the result. Right? So this is, uh, that's uh, typically the most efficient way how you can multiply two tensors together. And then the computational cost can be easily computed, right? Uh, so here we said it involves a five-fold sum. And if each index go, goes over D elements, then you get the computational cost simply by multiplying all these dimensions together. So meaning D times D times D times D times D. So that's D to the power of five. OK, so the way to find the computational cost of a pairwise multiplication is simply by multiplying all these uh, dimensions together. OK, so we can go to back to this example here. For example, these two tensors. So we can count the number of legs. So that's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. So this would be d to the power of 6. And then in this example, we would have like 1 leg, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. So that would be d to the power of 7. And then in the next example, you have 1, 2, 3, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So make sure that you count connected legs only once. So this would be d to the power of eight, and then we can go on, that's also the eight. And you will see that the leading computational cost here is d to the power of eight. And that's in the end the cost which really matters most, right? This is the leading computational cost to contract this network. and. Uh, that's in the end what matters if you go to larger and larger bond dimensions. This is going to be the bottleneck of the contraction. So whenever you try to find a good way to contract a network, you have to find a way which reduces the leading computational cost. OK. And I guess probably you have seen this example, right? There's a bad way how to contract uh, an NPS. So here's an, uh, the norm of an NPS. If you contract it in this way, that's of course bad because it will create here uh, a big object with many legs. So this will grow exponentially with uh, system size. But the right way to do it is to contract it kind of from left and the right, where you always absorb uh, cat and bra tensors uh, in this big tensor. OK, so that's the good way. Right, so we can contract an NPS in, a, in an efficient way. But now let's have a look at the PEPS case. And now let's just take this example of a, of a 3 times 3 peps, so just uh, 9 sides. And let's compute the norm of it. So here you have the, the ket of the wave function, and here you have the bra of the wave function. And what we can do now is to take this upper half here, here and push it towards the lower half. So that's shown here. And then we can multiply always the ket uh, tensor together with the bra tensor on the same side, shown here. 
And this results then in this square lattice network of these tensors here, which are also called reduced tensors. Right? So these reduced tensors, uh, you obtain them by multiplying the corresponding uh, ket and bra tensors. And then finally, we can also combine these two uh, bond dimensions of D together uh, to have like a big index between these tensors. So in the end, to compute the norm, this boils down in uh, contracting the square lattice network of reduced tensors, right? which have the, the bond dimension of uh, D squared. Okay, so let's try to do this. So uh, here we have such a square, lat square lattice network of these reduced tensors. And let's now find a way to contract this um, network. So we can start up here, multiply these two tensors together. Let me take the next one and the next one. And then you notice quite quickly that no matter how we contract, how we try to contract this network, this is always going to be exponentially hard. Right? Because here we create a, a tensor which has as many legs as the linear system size. Right? So if you, get, if you contract uh, an entire row here, this object will, be, will have an order of uh, parameters of d to the power of 2L. So that's something which grows exponentially with system size. Okay, so this is uh, not efficient. Uh, so it, it seems like uh, an exact contraction of a uh, PEPS is exponentially hard. So this seems like very bad news. But the good news is really that there exist several ways how to contract this network in a controlled approximate way. Right? So there are approximate methods, but which are controlled, uh, which allow you to um, contract uh, a PEPS. Now there are different schemes. There's like a scheme based on a NPS approach. There's the corner transfer matrix method. There are several methods uh, under this family here, TRG, so tensor parameterization group, which also includes high order TRG, SRG, and high order SR SRG, and I think we'll hear a lot about this in, uh, in Tao Xiang's uh, lecture later. And then from here, there were also uh, more recent developments on extensions of this idea called TNR, uh, tensor network uh, randomization. Now, I will give you an overview of these methods, what the idea is. But let me first mention what they all have uh, in common. Namely, the accuracy of the approximate contraction is controlled by another bond dimension. So not D, but we call it a chi here. Uh, so this is a parameter which then controls the accuracy of your approximate uh, contraction. So whenever you compute something, so when you contract the network, you have to make sure that things are converged as a function of this parameter chi. Okay, and then the overall cost uh, of these methods scales roughly as d to the power of 10 to d to the power of 14, depending on the method you are using, where chi roughly scales as uh, d squared. Okay, so let me now just show you one example uh, to start with of such a convergence uh, in chi. Okay, so this is an example of the 2D Heisenberg model. So that was obtained with the corner transfer matrix method. Um, so that's the energy per site as a function of one of these parameter chi. Okay, and here I show you data for different bond dimensions, uh, D4, five, 5, and 6. Okay, so let's have a look at, at these uh, points here. So imagine we have done an optimization of our PEPs and now we want to contract it and compute the energy. And to compute the energy, we can choose different values of chi here. And the larger chi, the more accurate is our uh, contraction. And then you see that uh, the energy as a function of chi actually converges quite rapidly and uh, does not change anymore here. So that's for d equals 4. Here, this is for d equals 5. And that's for d equals 6. So in the end, you see that uh, if you compute expectation values, they converge quite quickly as a function of chi. So in the end, we try to make sure that things have converged as a function of chi. And then you see the error due to the chi is really very small compared to the variations that you get as a function of d. Right? So there's a 
huge difference between D4, 5, and 6, but really tiny, tiny differences when you change uh, this chi value. Yes? Have you ever encountered a case where this is not monotonic? Like that you think it could converge and you go on and then at some point it goes again? It, not in such an extreme way. Uh, let's say I found, I found cases where, uh, where uh, it's, not, it's not smooth, so it's kind of a zigzagging or something. Um, but like that it would go on for a very long time and it looks very convergent then makes a step. I mean, in principle, it could exist yeah. always like things like that, but it's, uh, I, I did not... Uh, yeah, there uh, one more question. Uh, how about uh, the crossover, the value for chi, I mean, depending upon as a function of d? Is yes, it, right. Is it, is it known? Mm -hmm. Well, this, this uh, of course, also depends on the on the system uh, on the system itself. So it grows. So chi roughly scales as d squared, but it's it you have to typically choose something larger than d squared. Oh. So it's it grows more rapidly than d squared, but still not something which kind of explodes. Uh -huh. So in the end, uh, I don't, uh, I never did an estimate of actually the okay. of the, of how it scales, because this really, uh, you would do this check for, mm -hmm. for each model individually and see mm -hmm. what the influence of the, of the chi is actually. So one important remark is about the variational energy, right? Because the ansatz view is variational, so it's always, it always gives you an upper bound to the true ground state energy, Right? And that's a nice feature because you then can com compare with other variational methods to see how your energy compares with uh, other variational approaches. But because there can be an error on the energy due to the contraction, you have to be careful if your energy obtained is really variational or not. Now in this case, it's, it's pretty safe because the energy here converges from above meaning that each of these points here will be an upper bound to the true ground state energy, so we can say, okay, these values are, uh, are variational. But there are also cases where it does not nicely converge from above, but uh, for small chi it can be actually lower. So whenever you want to claim that you have a variational energy, you first have to check that things are converged as a function of chi to, to be sure that you, that there's not that you don't get a value which is actually lower than the ground state because of, of a finite uh, chi effect. Okay, so that's uh, I think that's an important point uh, whenever you want to compare two other variational methods. Okay, so then let me uh, briefly go over these uh, methods and I will spend most of the time here uh, with the quantum transfer matrix method. But I will start here with the NPS based approach which is if you already know about uh, NPS uh, techniques, then this is kind of the most uh, natural way how to contract uh, this network. Because we can just look at this first row in the network, and then we see that this is actually nothing. We can see it as a matrix product state, right? So it's a bit of funny matrix product state because the physical dimension here is also d squared, and also the auxiliary bond is d squared. But if you just look at this picture, it, it has the same structure as a matrix product state. Right? And then if you take the next row, then this has the same structure as a matrix product operator. Right? We have a, a, an incoming leg and an outgoing leg, and then uh, auxiliary bonds uh, on the horizontal. So we have an NPS and NPO, and we want to multiply them together. And that's, of course, something which is uh, well known from uh, NPS-based techniques. Right? So one way uh, to do it would be simply to multiply these tenses uh, together. Then we would have a new NPS with an increased bond dimension. So we have two uh, indices here. So we have a total uh, bond dimension of d squared times d squared. And then the next step is that we want to comp compress this NPS. So that's also something you probably have learned uh, in this workshop. How we can compress this NPS uh, from d squared d squared down to this value chi, which is our bond dimension for contraction. Okay, so by doing this, you see we have absorbed one row here into the boundary. And then we can just go on. We can take the next row here. Uh, see it as an MPO, multiply it to the boundary, and then truncate again. And we can proceed from top to down until this uh, entire network is uh, contracted. And of course, we can also do it from another direction, so we can also start from 
from the bottom go to the top, or we could start from the left side and the right side, uh, and so on. Okay, so this is how you can compute uh, the norm. And now the thing is you can use, if you can compute the norm, you can automatically also compute expectation values uh, of local observables, right? So imagine we want to compute an expectation value of this uh, two-side operator O in between uh, these two sides here, right? The thing is now that the expectation value or the, the tensor network is only going to change on these two sides here, but the tensor network surrounding these two sides will be the same as in the norm, right? So that's also called the environment of these two sides. So we can use, for example, the technique I mentioned before to contract uh, this, this network here to compute the environment, uh, resulting in these uh, tensors here, so which surround uh, the two sides. And then if you have computed this environment here, then you can simply uh, introduce the remaining uh, tensors, right? So on these two sides here, that's the ket and bra peps tensors, and that's the ket and bra tensor on the other side. And then in between we sandwich the operator which you wanna uh, compute, right? So in the end, the message is when, whenever we can compute the norm, uh, so these contraction methods, you then can use them also to compute um, expectation values of uh, observables. Okay, so now let me come to the corner transfer matrix uh, RG method, uh, which I guess you already heard uh, in uh, Tomotoshi Nishino's talk on, on Friday, but I will uh, explain this also now in, in this context. So the, the goal is um, to contract an infinite PEPS. So we have now this square lattice of reduced tensors which stretches to in, uh, infinity. And the goal is now that we can compute the environment of some uh, given side here. So let's focus on the center side here. And the goal is to compute these uh, environment tensors given by these corner tensors C1, C2, C3, and C4, and these four edge tensors here, T1 to T4. And this C1 here, in the end, takes into account this infinite upper left corner of the system, so the thing which is shaded in gray here. Then T1 takes into account the infinite half column shown here, and so on, right? So this environment tends to really account for the infinite system surrounding uh, this uh, center side here. And again, the accuracy can be controlled uh, by this uh, boundary dimension chi here, so which controls the accuracy of this uh, environment. Now the idea of the CTM, or the goal, is to construct these environment tensors in an iterative way by letting the system grow uh, in all directions. Okay. And let me explain here how you can do uh, the so-called directional CTM, where you grow the system in, in all the directions, uh, one after the other. So I will show you here how you can let the system grow on the left side of the system, which is called a, a left move. So for that, we start with uh, this small network here. So just a, a three times three network with, uh, we can start with some initial uh, guess for the boundary here. And then what we do is to increase a copy of this row here, so T1A and T3. We just introduce a new copy here. Uh, so we have grown the system <coughs> by a new column. And then the next step is to multiply this column onto the left uh, boundary. Right? So here we just absorb T1 into C1, A into T4, and T3 into C4. And that's then the result here. And now you see we have a new corner C1 tilde, T4 tilde, and C4 tilde, which now take, take into account two columns uh, of our system. But of course, here we now have an increased bond dimension, so we have two lines in between. So the <coughs> last step is to perform a renormalization, where we truncate this large, uh, so these two in, um, this large space into a smaller uh, space of dimension chi here. And this is then the result after the left move, so C1 tilde, T4 tilde, and C4 tilde, which now contain uh, two columns, 
but with the same bond dimension here on the left side. Okay, so this is called a left move. And now very similarly, you can also do a right move, a top move, and a down move. And this you reiterate over and over until you have reached convergence. And once you have reached convergence, these environment tensors then really contain the infinite system surrounding the center side. Okay, now the most, um, I mean, the, the most tricky part is, of course, this renormalization step here. How we can do this renormalization. And let me now first discuss it for the case where you have rotational and reflection symmetry. That's the most uh, easy case, uh, which was also in this uh, original paper uh, by uh, Tomotoshi Nishino and Okunishi in 1996. Uh, um, uh, when you use it for the, for the classical case, for example. Um, so let's have a look at this network here. And let's make a cut here, right? So here we cut a, a leg with dimension chi and the leg with dimension d squared here, right? And then the question is, what are the relevant states we need to keep if you want to renormalize this, this space, so from chi d squared down to chi again, right? How can we select the best states here? And now the thing is that you can actually identify what is shown here as a reduced density matrix of this left side here. Okay, and why is that? So, so let's just take this upper part here. So the question is, what is the relevant subspace of these two <coughs> legs here? So of this left side. And the thing is now that you can see what is shown here. You can see it as a matrix product state with a physical dimensions chi, d squared, d squared, and chi. So here we have two lines in between the MPS tensors, but again, we can just group them into one line and then what you see here then would really be just a, a foresight uh, NPS. And then of course the question what states you should keep here is given by DMRG, which tells you you should take the eigenvectors with uh, extremal eigenvalues of the reduced density matrix on this left side here. Okay, And what is shown here is exactly the reduced density matrix um, of this NPS here. Uh, on this side, right? So if we cut this diagram here open, then this corresponds to reduced density matrix. So all we need to do is to <coughs> diagonalize this reduced density matrix and look for the uh, eigenvectors with the uh, largest eigenvalues. Now in this case, it's even a bit simple. Yes? Sure. Doesn't this argument only work if we have like complete rotational? Exactly. Symmetry? So this is, this is really the simplest case, the rotational symmetric case. And I'll come to the asymmetric asymmetric case uh, later on, which is indeed more tricky. <coughs> um, so it's, here it's even uh, simpler, so you don't need to compute this entire thing, but it's actually enough to just look at one uh, corner here. Because you see, because of rotational symmetry, you have the same corner here four times repeated. So right, if you write this as a matrix, then what you have here is this matrix to the power of four. So instead of doing an eigenvalue decomposition of this matrix to the power of 4, you can also do just an eigenvalue decomposition or an SVD of the, of the matrix itself. Okay, so what we can do is to multiply all these uh, tensors together, resulting in this tensor here, and then we do an eigenvalue decomposition or an SVD. And then uh, this, this gives us this uh, U tensor here, uh, this isometry, and then we perform a truncation, so we only keep the states uh, with largest uh, single values or eigenvalues. <coughs> so that's this uh, U tilde. And then if you look at U tilde dagger U tilde, this in the end will give you an approximate resolution of the identity in the relevant subspace. Here, right? So that's the thing you can now introduce into this cut, cut here to perform a renormalization. Okay, so meaning that this U here, this U tilde, really selects you the, the right relevant states. So you can now use this U tilde to renormalize your corners and also your, your edges here. Okay, so by doing this, you obtain your C prime with bond dimension chi and your T prime with uh, bond dimension chi. <coughs> and now, because this is a, a rotational symmetric case, 
This is also going to be the solution for the other corners, right? So if it's rotational symmetry, you can simply then make a copy of that result for all the corners and also all the edges. So in that simple uh, example, we grow the system in all four directions simultaneously. May I? Yes? So the how do you set the corner transformations at the beginning? So you can, um, you, you can essentially you can initialize them in a, in a random way, or you can also make sure that it's still, uh, so you can also take some of your bulk tensors and, and contract them to have some initial state for the boundary. But in the end, the thing is, if you retrade this many, many times, then the boundary will move infinitely far away, so it should not, it should not really depend on the, on the thing you have on the, on the boundary. Yeah. I mean, at least in the, in the usual case. Then what if this A tensor is supposed to give us some cat state? Then maybe this irrelevant choice of this random that's right, okay, exactly. So there are, of course, cases where you have to be careful with the boundary. So, I mean, there might be cases where you actually want to have a well-defined boundary and not something random. And then you can, I mean, that's something you can, uh, you can play around with uh, in the end. So that's, uh, you have this freedom. Or if you take a 2D classical system, you could also initialize your boundary really with the uh, boundary of the 2D partition function on the boundary, for example. And that's, uh, you have this option. Okay, so this is the rotational symmetric case. Now, in the case which is not symmetric, so where you don't have rotational and reflection symmetry, things are a bit uh, more complicated, and there's also different ways how to actually choose uh, the renormalization. And I show you here one uh, way to do it, which turned out to work well uh, in practice, and that's uh, by splitting the system into an upper half and lower half, and then first perform um, an SVD or QR decomposition. So we have an R matrix here and the orthonormal matrix Q here, and the same for the lower half. So again, the, the goal is to find uh, suitable projectors here, which we can introduce uh, in this cut. And then we use this R and R tilde matrices to uh, try to come up with a, an approximate resolution of the identity. So here is an exact identity, right, given by r minus 1, r, r tilde, r tilde minus 1, right? So that's, that's an exact identity. But now we can multiply these two tenses here together, that's shown here, and then perform an SVD where we only keep uh, the chi largest single values, right? So we multiply this and then approximate it uh, by an SVD. If you have this relation here, then you automatically also can write what r tilde minus 1 r minus 1 is. So that's just by the inverting uh, this thing here. So here we have the single values, uh, the inverse of the single values. And now we can introduce these expressions down here. So we have to do a couple of uh, calculations, and that's what you end up with. Um, and then identifying this. You can identify the upper part here with uh, this projector P tilde and the lower part with the projector P. And this, in the end, defines you uh, some projectors going from key, chi d squared down to uh, chi n. Okay, so that's, um, these are projectors which have been already used in, in another context. And they also seem to work uh, quite well uh, here for the corner transfer matrix in the case of an asymmetric uh, situation. So instead of taking half of the system up here, you could also take only a quarter, that's computationally uh, a bit cheaper, but then you take less into account of your system. Or you could actually even take the entire thing here, so not cutting the system open, and do uh, something similar here. So there's some variety uh, you, can, you can use. Yes? yes? the minimum QR decomposition. So QR is essentially, you can also do an, an SVD where R is essentially the U times S part. In so the QR the is, 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 I mean, a Q is a, is a unitary or, or orthogonal matrix and R is an upper triangular matrix. Okay, so but my question is why we need the decomposition? So why? So it's like, in the end it's like, um, 
so this is the, the a unitary. So in, in the end, it's it's a, it's a similar situation as in a as in a as in a matrix product state where you want to get things into into a, a left and right canonical form here in the middle, right? So if you have let's just take uh, two things here, if you want to compute projectors in here, you would also do you do an SVD, right? So you would or QR, you would, uh, so let's take SVD, which is maybe more familiar. So you would split it into U part, and then the SV part here, and then here you would do the same, so you have a U part, SV part, you would combine these two things and then do uh, um, uh, an SVD of this thing here to do the, the, the good truncation, right? So in the end, it's, it's like bringing um, things into canonical form with respect to this uh, this cut over there. So here, this would be the, the unitary part, and here is the S times V part that you bring uh, over to this cut here. I don't know if that's okay, so eventually, once you have these projectors, you then use them again to perform your left move here, and in a very similar way, you can do it in the other. Then there are four cuts here, right? There are four cuts. Yes. Uh, so you insert the projector instantaneously or successively. So this, uh, I will introduce these projectors only on the left side, and then do the same thing if I want to do a right move, I would compute the projectors on the right side or on the top side or the, on the down side, right? So because here I don't have any symmetries, um, uh, I, I have to compute these projectors for all the sides uh, independently. Question. Uh, so uh, your procedure involves, uh, I mean, uh, includes uh, inverse, inverse matrix yes. R inverse and R tilde inverse. And it may include some uh, very, very extremely small similar values. Exactly. So this is not uh, cause a problem. Yeah, so here you have to, of course, here you have to be careful with um, if, if single values are small here, you should do a, a cutoff, uh -huh. right? So uh, essentially, if the single value stretches over more than 10 or 12 orders of magnitude, mm -hmm. you should do a cutoff because otherwise uh, mm -hmm. you can have instability problems due mm -hmm. to this. I see. So this is also actually the reason. So I mentioned before that you, you have some freedom here in computing the projectors based on only the corner half of the system are actually uh, taking the entire network here to compute the projectors. The, the, the most accurate thing would actually be to use the whole the entire network, so without the cut here, mm -hmm. but then the, the single values will be more stretched, mm -hmm. which can potentially lead to more uh, instability problems. So there's mm -hmm. like a trade-off uh, between mm -hmm. the two. Mm -hmm. So in the end, it would be good if one could, uh, uh, yeah, so the, the problem is really if, if they vary over two large magnitudes. I mean, you would need to go to high precision calculations mm -hmm. if you really want to do that, or find some other trick. Mm -hmm. so, so if you want to do a right move, we'll be doing some uh, LQ on the up. Uh, are you doing QR for upper cap, you are doing QR to come later, right? Uh, yeah, so this is for the left move, and for the top move, I will do the same, same thing here, the cut here and the cut here. So right move will be uh, right IQ. move. Right move will be the same, but the QR on the other side, right? Yeah, just mm -hmm. just just switch. Okay. So anyway, I mean that's uh, there's also groups right now who are still trying to improve all these things. Uh, Matthew is actually also thinking about ways to do CTM. Uh, so I mean that's uh, that's maybe not the end of the story. So that could still be. Uh, still be new things. Okay, so now I would like to just briefly explain what you need to do when you have a larger unit cell sizes, because what I have been talking about so far was just having one single tensor A, and the idea is if you have larger unit cells is that you, you um, assign coordinates to each of the tensors, and the coordinates kind of denote the coordinates with respect to the unit cell, right? So here we have a three times two unit cell, so here we have x coordinates and here we have y coordinates. So here we have uh, the tensor on coordinate 1, 1, here 2, 1, 3, 1, and that would be 
1, 2, 2, 2, and 3, 2. Okay, so each page tensor has coordinates and so have the reduced tensors, right? They also have coordinates. And the thing is now that uh, if you want to do a CTM, then now you also assign coordinates to all of these environment uh, tensors here, right? So we don't only keep a copy, one single copy for C1, for example, but we have a corresponding coordinate tensor for each position in the unit cell. Okay, meaning that um, right, if we look at the um, reduced tensor here at coordinate x and y, right, that's shown here, coordinate x and y, then there are the corresponding environment tensors which connect to this uh, tensor here, right, so we would have the T4 environment tensor at coordinate x minus 1 and, and y, this would be the corner tensor at um, coordinate x1 uh, minus 1 and so on. And you see uh, we have in the end six different uh, C1s and we have to choose the right C1 in the end. I mean, depending on the coordinate we have here, we have to make things uh, consistent that they, they match uh, together. Okay, so the, the goal in the end is to keep uh, the same uh, number of copies uh, as you have uh, tensors in your unit cell. And then we are not going to compute these environment tensors uh, uh, independently, but we can actually comp compute them uh, all together uh, during the CTN procedure. Okay, and the idea is the following. So, for example, when we start here from this tensor at coordinate x and y, and here this uh, left edge, and we do a left move, right? So we do an absorption and renormalize the corners. Then you can see we start from this corner C1 at coordinate x minus 1 and, and y minus 1. And this updates our corner C1 prime at coordinate x. Right? It's like we shift, uh, we move from this position x minus 1 to update the boundary at position x. Right? And now we have to do this for all y coordinates and we have to repeat it also for all x coordinates until we have absorbed the entire unit cell to the left side. Okay, so doing a left move is not only a single step, but we have to absorb the entire unit cell into the left boundary. Okay, so just to be very uh, kind of um, uh, to, to show you really the, a full example here, I try to do things uh, with colors. So let's start with the left move here, where we have this. Uh, um, reduced tensors here in the middle, the yellow one. And then you see the environment tensors that we have to connect to this yellow tensors are here the blue edge tensor. So that's the blue edge tensor here. And then the corner tensor at this position and corner tensor at this position. So these are the green ones here. And here orange and orange. So that's the T1 and T3, right? So that's how things, that, that's the environment we have to use for this yellow A tensor. And then we perform um, a left move, just one step absorbing, and this will then update the edge at this position here. So we get a new corner tensor for this position. So C1 prime and C4 prime and T4 prime, right? So we started from this boundary here and did a left move to update the boundary at this position. Okay, so this was now for y coordinate 1, and then we have to do the same thing for y coordinate 2, so for the orange one here, right, with the boundary blue, green, blue, and edges uh, yellow, yellow, so that's shown here. And then again, we do uh, one step, and this updates the corner at this position, corner at this position, and edge at this position. Okay, so we have done position x1 for the two y coordinates and now we move on so we we are here and then take uh, this ball tensor so the red one and these edges uh, the, the, the pink ones here and this will then update again the boundary at this position too we do the same for the y coordinate so we get the updated boundary at this position here and so on and then we do the last step. And finally, we will have updated 
the boundary tense is we started from, right? So because we, we moved three steps to the, to, the, to, the, to the right, so one, two, three, and we ended up with the blue things again, right? So this completes a whole um, left move where we absorb the entire unit cell to the left. And then you see we, we don't throw these tenses away, but we actually store all these tenses here for the individual coordinates. And if we have that, then we also can compute local expectation values simply by connecting the corresponding uh, environment tensors. Okay, so that's kind of the... Uh, I have a question. Yes? If we, uh, every step we need to calculate the projector... Exactly, yes. So that's... What is a remind part of... Uh, <laughs> yeah, you, sh you said about two strategies to calculate the... Uh, Projectors, so, so you need other the, the, the projectors are based on, you compute them based on this uh, 4 times 4 network, right, the one I showed, or, or based on the, on the coordinates. <coughs> so, I mean, if, if we take this example here, you take a 4 times 4 window, right, uh, meaning that here, if you want to compute the projector, for example, for this uh, in between this in this space here, then you would do this based on the four times four environment shown here, I see. right? So you just so you can assign coordinates to projectors as well, and then you have to take the the, the corresponding environment tenses which match to these coordinates, mm -hmm. right? So here uh, things are written out in in pseudocode, right? So you do for all x in your unit cells. You do for all y in your unit cells, and then you first compute all the projectors for a given row, right? So these uh, yellow ones, and then once you have computed all the projectors, you do again a loop over all y, and then do um, the renormalization uh, so of, of these edges here moving to the next uh, position in x. Okay, so that's kind of things in, in, uh, in pseudocode. Okay, so that's uh, CTM for larger unit cells. So now we can take uh, arbitrary cell sizes. So for example, here, three times three unit cell where each tensor is different. But you don't need to stick to rectangular unit cells. So you can also take uh, different shapes of unit cells. And you can do this simply by uh, making some of the tensors in the unit cell uh, equivalent, right? So here, um, I would have this square lattice cell, but the actual unit cell would, o would only uh, contain three sides here, a blue, a yellow, and, and a green side here. So you don't need to, you can work with a rectangular unit cell, but it doesn't need to be that every tensor is different in that unit cell. And you can also go to very large uh, unit cells, and if there's time, I will also talk about this example here uh, for the Shasby Sutherland model. So, uh, here we used really large unit cells uh, <coughs> containing up to 30 tensors, or that's in this case it was actually 60 spin on half sides. And this is not a rectangular unit cell, but you see it has this uh, particular shape here. Right? And in the end the computational cost scales only linearly with the unit cell size, so in the end you can really go to very large uh, unit cells and um, do uh, computations with them. Of course, the more tricky part is that when you increase your unit cell sizes, then the optimization can become more tricky that you actually, uh, that you're not stuck in a local minimum. Okay, so let's see. Uh, yes? So if you have a unit cell, like a proper exam, you have a unit cell of another rectangular shape, but how, is it, you, have, you always have to map it back to the rectangular yeah, exactly. I, I, okay. I have a rectangular code, but in the end, if, yeah, I, if I do a left move, if I do a left move, I, I keep kind of track of which copy of the tensor is in which position. And then if uh, on the boundary, I also, so you can imagine I have these colors here, and then I would also only keep three copies in my boundary. And then, uh, and then just, you know, if I update a certain boundary tensor, I would automatically also update the equivalent. Uh, so if I have a triangle lattice, then I have to somehow squish it into a 
if you have a triangular lattice, but then it's uh, anyway, then it's the question how you can, if you want to use a square lattice CTM code or if you want to use uh, a CTM for another geometry. But you can, a triangular lattice, you can always think of having a square lattice with uh, yes. some, some diagonal bond, but then depending on how you do the mapping, you can, uh, can, you can do it in different ways. So I don't remember, I mean here, the rectangular cell size of this thing, I don't remember what it was, but it would be much larger than, than 30 tensors, right? So in that case, uh, it was important to actually keep the number of tensors low by choosing a non-rectangular uh, cell. Okay, just very briefly, I guess we will hear about this in Tao Shang's talks, but just for completeness, so TRG uh, is one of the methods how we can contract uh, a PEPs with periodic boundary conditions and the main idea here is that um, you look at the tensors on sublattice A and perform an SVD in such a way here where you keep uh, just chi, the chi largest singular values and you can absorb them to the uh, left and right side and you do something similar on sublattice B and then you can uh, replace that uh, down here for sublattice A and B, this results in this network. And then you multiply tensors on such plackets together here, and the final uh, result looks then like this. So that's after one iteration. And if you reiterate this uh, several times, then you can contract uh, such a network with uh, periodic boundary conditions. Now there's related schemes, uh, SRG, higher order TRG, and higher order SRG. And uh, again, I guess we will hear more about these schemes uh, in, in, in the next lecture today. Then uh, a more recent development uh, is tensor network normalization, which in the end borrows ideas from the uh, MIRA. So one of the main ingredients in the MIRA tensor network is to have disentanglers, which uh, disentangle uh, neighboring blocks, so they remove short range entanglement. So that was an idea in the MIRA ansatz for a wave function and the TNR in the end uses the same idea to, for a coarse graining scheme of, uh, of 2D networks. So in the end I will not really go into the details but essentially here what you see here is a coarse graining scheme um, and if you forget about the green tensors then we have the same as TRG but the green tensors here are really the new elements so these are the so-called disentanglers which are there to remove short range entanglement uh, between, uh, between neighboring blocks. And one can show that this is really a, a very powerful coarse graining scheme, especially if you take systems at, uh, at criticality. Okay, so you get a faster convergence in CHI and you can get a kind of a proper coarse graining schemes for, for systems at uh, criticality. So that's the original one here by uh, Glenn Evenbly and uh, Gifre Vidal, but there's also uh, other developments, uh, so-called loop TNR, which are uh, related to this uh, idea. Okay, but I will not really uh, go more into this. So this, huh? no, oh yeah. Last part, uh, if we want to calculate uh, some extraction, extraction values, some uh, local uh, operator, how can we do this? Because uh, in the case of the, uh, on a transformer matrix, uh, finally we get the environment. In this case, how can I get the environment? So in the end, uh, you can, you could uh, coarse grain also the local expectation value and keep it, uh, I mean, pull it up to the next next coarse grain level and then compute uh, local expectation values. But then there are also these ideas about the uh, second realization or higher order SRG where you actually can go the way back. So you, you contracted everything, but then from there you go backwards um, because the coarse grain transformation defines you all these tenses here. And then finally, when you arrive here, you can also go backwards reintroducing all these tenses to eventually then introduce some, uh, some impurity tensor here, which would give you some local expectation value. So there are different ways uh, how, to deal, how to deal with this. But I think in their paper here, the way they talked about it was would really to introduce some um, uh, impurity tensor here for the expectation value, and then also coarse grain uh, this one. Yes? Sorry. Um, so let's say I try to whatever, simulate a critical system into either 
on the way, doing your app and everything, every step in the environment. Of course, initially your tensor will describe some other state and so But can you say, like, when you converge towards the ground state, will your environment or the environment tensors describe a critical state? Kind of no, I think we will never, in practical simulations, I guess, we will never get there. So I think whenever in a practical simulations your finite bond dimension will always produce a gap state. But this, I mean, in the end, this is not so bad because in the end, you know, I mean, you can say the same thing is in Monte Carlo simulations, right? right? You never represent an infinite state. So the, 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 the final thing is then really to do systematic analysis as a function of D because your gap will become smaller and smaller. Uh, but in the end, this is also good. Um, uh, a good message because if we are always in the gap regime, we also know that our boundaries actually well behave and th th these contraction schemes uh, should work well in that case. Right. right. So apart from, from a numerical scheme, is there kind of a notion, can you say that theoretically your entanglement degrees of freedom state should be critical if it's describing a critical state or is there no such You mean on the, on the boundary? Yeah. Uh, I don't even know if this statement makes sense if you don't know. No, no, I think you can, exactly. So if you would take a critical system, then in the end you have the problem that your boundary MPS, whatever, should also uh, be able to represent a critical system, which it, which it can't, right? And that's why, I mean, here you can think of this thing as having a mirror structure on the boundary, and this is why in the end it can be used for, uh, for critical systems. But again, in practice, I, I don't worry so much about that because right. what I get is not, I think I will never get something which is really critical. So that's why it's not, uh, it's not so important, let's say. But has anyone, or have you ever tried comparing, let's say, uh, these different contraction methods for critical states and see that it doesn't make a difference? No, no, if but you, you see, it makes a difference. So here, here you get really uh, extremely fast convergence as a function of chi at a critical point, yeah. right? This you can see, right? You can see that the scaling is, uh, I mean, the, the slope goes down much faster. And we know that with, with CTM, we probably can never reach, you know, the, the, the true critical state. But on the other hand, CTM is much uh, cheaper, right? So meaning that uh, in, in the end, we, we get reasonably... Uh, high accuracy, I mean the slope does not go down, but it's much cheaper to get a uh, high precision in the end. But we know it's, it's not, you know, theoretically it does not, it's not, it does not work for, uh, how, how shall I say, there's kind of a limit for that, but then in practice this is, I think this is good enough, let's say. But I mean, again, I mean, there's also other motivations why to use such uh, coarse graining schemes, right? So, in the, and in the end, uh, <coughs> there's also ways to combine ideas. So, in the end, I think this this is very interesting, and I think, uh, right, because that in the end, it's not the end of the story, right? So, you can write, start combining uh, also ideas from this TNR with CTM and so on. I mean, that's uh, you can try to pick out the most important ideas to come up with, with something which is cheaper but includes uh, similar ideas. Okay, so uh, so it's it's, an, it's still an active field of research, these contraction methods, right? So that's uh, it's very interesting what developments have been made over the past few years, so it's, uh, it's very interesting to see where this goes. Okay, so uh, time is running, um, so then let me go to this simple examples uh, or exercises for those who want to try it. Um, and the first one is the CTM method for the classical 2D easing model. Now, probably don't need to explain it in too much detail. I guess you saw this in, in the lecture on, on Friday. But uh, just to, to give you an idea, so I mean, I guess you know the easing model, so you have just uh, sum over nearest neighbors, and S are uh, easing variables, so plus one or minus one. And we look at the ferromagnetic case, so that's the uh, Ising model, which has a disordered phase at high temperature and the ordered ferromagnetic phase at, at low temperature. Right, so that's a classical system which we consider in 2D, and we can use the corner transfer matrix method to actually study uh, the, the finite temperature properties of that system. Right, we can write down the partition function just given by the sum over all spin configurations, and here we have the Boltzmann weight. And now we can introduce the sum here in the exponential 
and then take out the sum as a product. Right here, everything is commuting, so this is exact. So we can write the partition function as a sum of all spin configurations of the product of these local spin configurations here. Okay? And in the end, we will see that we can represent this as a tensor network. The magnetization, of course, uh, can be computed just by measuring the spin at some reference site R here, and then weigh it with the Boltzmann weight divided by the partition function. And the nice thing about this example is that we can always compare also with the exact result. OK, so the goal is to compute the magnetization using uh, tensor network methods. And now the idea of uh, we can represent this as a, as a 2D tensor network. So I guess you probably have seen this on, on Friday. The idea is really the following, right? So we have this product here of these local weights here. So what we have here is just a 2 times 2 matrix. So we just have two neighboring spins, and we have four possibilities. We can have up, up, down, up, up, down, and down, down. So we can write the weights of these four configurations in a 2 times 2 matrix and put these <coughs> weights on the links of these two-dimensional tensor networks. So here, these green things are these 2 times 2 matrices we have here. And then on the vertices, we simply put a delta function, which uh, just fixes the spins in, in, in horizontal and vertical direction. So the red dots that you have here, if you look at what you have here, this is exactly the sum over all spin configurations here, right? So at this vertex, we can have spin up and spin down. Here we can have spin up and spin down. Right? So at each vertex, we have a sum over the two spin configurations, so which gives us this total um, uh, sum over all spin configurations. And then for each spin configuration, you want to have the product of all the weights. So imagine if you have up here, up here, then the, this green matrix will give you the corresponding local weight, uh, so Q up, up here. And then uh, you get, uh, so for a fixed spin configuration, we, we will get automatically the product of all the corresponding uh, weights in the Q matrices. Okay, we can rewrite now this network simply by taking the Q tensor and splitting it apart. So we can take square root of Q and then absorbing four square root of Qs here on the vertex. And this in the end gives us this tensor network with A tensors. So the same structure which we had before. Right, so A is simply multiplying uh, four uh, square root of Qs here on the vertex. Then very similarly, the magnetization looks uh, very similar. Right? So the partition function is given by this square lattice network of A tensors. And for the magnetization, we just have one uh, different tensor here. So this B tensor, where we want to measure uh, the spin configuration. So here we just introduce this S here which is uh, up uh, or down, uh, depending on the local spin configuration. Okay, so we have this B tensor, which can be seen as an impurity tensor that we add here. Okay, then with the CTM, that what you can do is then to compute the environment surrounding this B tensor. And you see, we can use the same environment also down here for the A tensor, so we just compute uh, this environment here, and we obtain the expectation value of the magnetization by this ratio. Okay? So, um, as explained before, we can use the CTM method to compute C and T in, a, in an iterative way. And we have the simple case here that we have rotational symmetry, so we can use here the C tensors all to be the same, and also these edge tensors here to be all the same, so they have uh, the symmetries here. Okay, and then with the boundary, you can uh, easily think that you can just start from something uh, some, with a random uh, symmetric boundary, so you can in initialize it uh, in the random way. Okay, and then as explained before, uh, the way to do one of, of the CTM steps in the simple case is simply multiplying these four tensors together. You get this tensor, this tensor you do an SVD, and then you truncate this down to the chi important states and you use this to compute the renormalized tensor and renormalized edges. And then one thing uh, which you might need to do is uh, in order to keep the number 
numbers bounded in your tensors, you can divide the tensors by its largest element. If you don't do this, then after many iterations, the numbers can either grow to infinity or down to zero. So by keeping, by renormalizing the tensor after a step, uh, you keep the numbers bounded. And in the end, you see we're not interested, uh, these factors don't matter, because in the end we take ratios of tensor networks, so these factors actually cancel out in the end. Okay, so this is uh, one realization step. So what you need to do is to start from some initial boundary. You do these realization steps until you have reached convergence. There's different uh, convergence uh, criteria, and one thing you can do is to compare the spectrum of the singular values of the current step with the previous step, and if this goes below a certain tolerance, then, uh, then you have reached uh, convergence. Okay, so make sure that SK is, uh, so that these are truncated and normalized singular values. And once you have reached convergence, then you can compute uh, quantities uh, of interest. Okay, so I really think this is a, an ideal starting point if you want to try out something in 2D. And here I have a, a MATLAB code, which you can uh, download and uh, try out if you, I mean, you can try first <laughs> Uh, yourself to see if you manage to do it, and uh, here would be kind of the solution uh, that you can look into. Okay, now the interesting thing is, so this is, uh, it's amazing in the end, it's, uh, it's not very uh, difficult to implement. So I actually recently gave this problem to a bachelor student. So I had two bachelor students, one I gave Monte Carlo, and the other one I gave the CTN, and uh, well, both didn't have any background before, right? So to both of them, the methods were new. And it was amazing in the end to see that, uh, so both students started from scratch and had to do uh, these codes from scratch. And it was amazing that the, the student with CTM got such a high precision just from using a simple code. So that's why I think it's really, it's really a very uh, remarkable uh, method. So, uh, so I would uh, suggest you that you look into it. So, but anyway, um, this is for the classical case, but then, uh, well, here are some results, but you can then check that yourself. Uh, starting from this, you can really do a very simple 2D quantum case, right? Um, because, so here before we had a classical partition function representing the 2D network, but in the quantum case, our A tensors represent the norm of a, of a 2D wave function, right? So with ket and bra tensors. And now we have a, a, a simple, we can take the simple case of a wave function where the PEPS tensors are translational and rotational symmetric, right? So this puts constraints on our IPEPS tensors. So if you use these constraints, then in the end, for d equals 2, we are left with uh, 12 free parameters. So depending on the system, you can even reduce it uh, further, right? So but in the end, it's, it's only a few parameters. So what you can do now is to um, use such a tensor here with the corresponding symmetry, compute this reduced tensor here, and then you can use the CTM code from the previous uh, thing for, with the rotational symmetry to do the contraction, and then you can really compute expectation values of uh, local observables of, of this 2D quantum system. Okay, so here would be a one-side observable, but if you want to compute the energy of the quantum system, then you need to uh, a two-side environment, which can be simply be constructed by taking here two edge tensors and two edge tensors here. So here, this will give us the environment uh, for for two sides, and then, as explained before, so if you have this environment for two sides, then in the end you just have to plug in uh, the two remaining PEPS tensors with the operator sandwiched in between. Okay, so this is the thing uh, you will need to implement, but then you can also compute uh, the energy. So, for example, you can take the 2D transverse easing model as a test case, and then you can uh, write a function which computes the energy using the CTA method for a given set of uh, your uh, 12 parameters. And you can, for example, just by hand try out different parameter sets and see what energies you get. But the thing is now, since we only have 12 parameters, you can also do 
uh, a brute force minimization. So you can just feed this function that you have written here, which gives you the energy, you can feed it into some you know, existing minimization routine. So for example, this fmincon uh, from MATLAB. Um, so you can call this function, pass the function you want to minimize, so that's the energy, and then uh, your initial uh, kind of parameters you want to start from. And here, this is kind of the um, uh, bounds on your parameters you want to search for. And because in the end, the, the, the global factor uh, in the elements of the pep tensor will not matter. You can constrain to that these elements are between uh, minus one and one. Okay, and this in the end is then a very simple way how to do a 2D quantum calculation with an optimization for this uh, uh, transverse easing model. And the amazing thing is that actually the accuracy you obtain here for d equals 2 is going to be better than if you would implement the full update uh, implementation. <laughs> So that's a thing. That, so I had this example also last year uh, at, a, at a school in Kent, and uh, I noticed that this simple thing here produced uh, more accurate results than the, the more sophisticated code I've been written over here. So that was a bit embarrassing, but in the end, this was also the motivation in the end why to develop uh, a variational optimization scheme. Because, of course, this doesn't work if you go to large bond dimensions because of brute force optimization will just be computationally too expensive. Um, but in the end, this is uh, one of the kind of motivations why energy minimization is really the thing that you want to do. But we will talk about this more uh, tomorrow. OK, so this, is, um, this you can also download here and uh, look into it and play around with it. So that's, I think, uh, a fun thing to do. And then in the end, you see that. The 2D tensor network code doesn't mean that it's, it must be huge, so you can do simple calculations already in a few lines, and that's kind of an interesting thing. Okay, so I think. So I Excuse me. Uh, oh, yeah? Is it possible to a complex tensor A give more uh, lower energy? Uh, why? Not, not in this case, no. Not in this case. So uh, essentially, so uh, there are cases where complex uh, tensors can give you. Uh, a lower energy if the state breaks time reversal symmetry. But if time reversal symmetry is kind of uh, um, conserved, then, then in the end you can, uh, can get away with um, real, real value tensors. So just one last thing which uh, I should probably mention, that the example codes here are based on the NCOM function, which has been developed by uh, Robert Pfeiffer, Glenn uh, Suki, and, and Gifford Vidal. And it's a very useful routine to contract tensor networks. I don't know if Glenn has been talking about this in his lecture. Okay, so then I, then here would just be an example, right? So whenever you want to contract something like this, you just add uh, negative indices for your resulting indices. So here this will create uh, a resulting index with index 1, 2, 3, and 4. So you just by putting minus 1, minus 2, minus 3, minus 4. And you add indices to, to, to connect, you add labels to the connected indices, which tell you that first you want to contract this index, that's the second, third, and fourth. And then it's one single line where you specify these values and the tensors to contract uh, this network. So it's a very uh, convenient way, especially if you go to very complicated uh, networks. But of course, there are other. Um, good routines and frameworks to do the contractions like the iTensor library or, or your Uni10 uh, library and so on. So you can do it uh, as you like. Okay, but I think uh, I've probably, uh, since time is up, I probably um, skip that part, right? About the Shastri Sarman or, or I mean, I don't know how. <laughs> yeah, you can go on. Really? So it is not <coughs> too long. If it's not too, I mean, it's, uh, I, can, I, I can do it, uh, I can just do it in a quick way. Uh, just, I, I, let me show this as an example of uh, applications of IBEPs really with large unit cells. And I think this is one of the main advantages over other methods, right? So here we use unit cells which are already too large to do exact diagonalization even for one unit cell, right? And that's really the advantage that we can do. Um, very big 
structures and these unit cells are then really embedded in, in an infinite system. So that's a, a frustrated uh, system uh, on this lattice here. So it's essentially a Heisenberg model with two different couplings. So here we have these J prime couplings between nearest neighbors and then we have the diagonal couplings uh, with uh, strength J uh, just along these diagonals here. And it's a nice problem because it has a very nice realization in this uh, material in the strontium copper borate. So um, uh, we have these copper sites here where the spin one half sit on. So at the end, what you have here is the same lattice as, uh, as shown on the left side. Or here would be another way how to draw the lattice. And then you see it's actually made of coupled uh, orthonormal, orthogonal dimers here. So you have these dimers here which are uh, coupled uh, Okay, um, so first thing we did was look at the phase diagram uh, at zero external magnetic field and there was actually some, uh, some question what this intermediate phase here could be. Right, so if J prime is J is zero then you're just left with these uh, diagonal couplings. So we have a dimer phase and in this limit we have a nil phase but what is in between was not uh, really clear. And uh, what we found here is this uh, such so-called placket phase here. Okay, but what is now really of interest for experiments on this material is to look at the Shastri Sutherland model in this dimer phase here, so close to the phase transition, but then with an external uh, magnetic field. Uh, because what has been found in uh, experiments is that several magnetization plateaus appear. So that's the external magnetic field as a function, so the, the magnetization as a function of the external magnetic field. And then you see these features uh, appearing here at one eighth and one fourth and one third. And then um, the big question is then uh, what kind of uh, states are realized in these plateaus. Now early on it has been found that the shastri sutherland model has almost uh, localized triplet excitations. Right, so if you start from this dimer phase here, we can create an excitation simply by taking such a singlet and making a, a triplet out of it. And then if you take two of these triplets and put them next to each other, you can actually show that on the mean field level, they feel a repulsion. Okay. And this then leads to the natural intuition that these magnetization plateaus correspond to crystals of these localized triplets because it's like there's only particles which repel, it, repel each other so they can form some crystal structures. Okay, and here are some early suggestions how these crystal structures could look like. So here you see the singlets in black and here in red this would be the triplet uh, excitations. So that would be the suggested crystal structure at one eighth and here's the structure at one fourth and one third, right? So, and these were su just suggestions because people didn't know how it uh, could look like. And then, uh, since then, um, there have been more, a lot of experimental work and also theoretical work, especially also here in, in Japan, um, and in experiments, uh, new uh, plateaus have been found. And in theory, people try to reproduce this sequence, but even after 15 years, there have still been mismatches, right? So in theory, there was a plateau one eighth, uh, one ninth, but only one at one eighth in experiments and so on, so there were still several mismatches and then also this plateau 2 15s always seemed to be a bit of mystery why should the plateau appear at this strange ratio so this has been a big puzzle for many years and in the end this really seemed to be an ideal problem for IPEPs because these crystal structures require large unit cells so our plan was to create all these triplet crystals and then check the variational energy to actually see which crystal structure is realized, right? So this was kind of the original plan. It's a tedious work, but uh, it's, uh, uh, we thought this is in it's interesting to try. But then the nice thing was that we got actually a big surprise here. Namely, it turned out that this original theoretical assumption that these crystals are made of these triplets was actually <coughs> wrong, right? And that was really uh, unexpected. And it turned out that these crystals are actually not made uh, of, of triplets. So let me show you what we actually obtained here. What you see here is, an, is one triplet excitation that was obtained here, four times four unit cell. 
So the excitation has been created here, so you have up, up, and then you also get some response from the neighboring sides, right? And then this is two triplet excitations in the same unit cell, but for small bond dimension, right? And if you take small bond dimension, you can reproduce the mean field result. And what you see here is, again, we have two triplet excitations which, which are pushed apart. So this is what people expected uh, to happen uh, based on mean field. But then if you go to larger bond dimensions, then you really obtain something completely different. So these are two uh, triplet excitations, but they don't repel each other, but form this, uh, this bound state of two triplets. So that's, this is an SC equals two uh, excitation. Okay, this is really, uh, this was really uh, unexpected and uh, I was working with uh, Frederick Miller on this problem who has been uh, writing theory papers on this for more than uh, uh, 10 years and uh, he was really very intrigued by this so we did many tests and finally we really concluded that these objects are, are stable and that in the end the crystals that you obtain are not crystals of these triplets but of these, uh, of these uh, bound state objects and here just see an example comparing the variational energies, so these are the triplet crystals and here we have these bound state crystals and you see we have a clear separation in energy uh, between these two uh, types of crystals, right? Two examples shown here. And then we also found something very similar for the other plateaus. In particular, if you take this strange 215th plateau, this suddenly makes perfect sense in terms of these bound state crystals. So it's really a regular structure of these uh, bound state objects, right? So this is now an example where, where we really needed a large unit cell, so uh, using 60 sides, 60 spin sides, and this unit cell is really infinitely uh, repeated. Okay, so I'll skip that, so we found the binding energy, and in the end, the way to think about this bound state is to have some resonance between, you know, triplets uh, here and, and between here, so it's like, again in kinetic energy by forming this type of uh, resonances around the placket which can stabilize such a bound state. Okay, so then the whole work was really about using all possible unit cell sizes to see what kind of crystal structures can be realized. So I mean, there's been, uh, a lot of uh, calculations here, but in the end we ended up in getting this magnetization curve with these uh, magnetization plateaus and this matches nicely the experimental sequence. So except this plateau at one-fifth, but then what we saw is that when we add a small uh, geologinsky maria interaction, which is known to be present in the real compound, that actually this plateau at one-fifth uh, is not stable anymore, so that in the end we, we obtain uh, an agreement with the experimental um, sequence. right? So in the end, this kind of really helped to get a new understanding of the magnetization process in this material. And in the end, it was also a nice uh, application of IPEPs, also because we are doing sort of unbiased simulations that you sometimes can also get uh, surprising results which were uh, not expected. And that's in the end uh, the beauty about tensor network methods that you can really get surprises, which in the end can give you a new intuition about uh, physical systems. Okay, but then we also had looked at the same problem at higher magnetic fields, but I will skip this part now, and uh, I think I will stop here, and thank you for your attention. Can you say again, sir? How did you get the cross state of function for this model? Oh, this was, uh, this was uh, combined simple and full update calculations. So imaginary time evolution. Are they in your And then you use the, the scalar tracer matrix method to... Yes, yes, yes. So this is all corner transformatics method and then also simple full update. And because we... So at some point we knew that we, what we want to obtain are these, ground, uh, these uh, bound state crystals, right? So you can also initialize your wave function putting these bound states on different locations and then do the optimization, which then helps for convergence. Uh, let's see. I mean, 
The thing is, if you really have a very large unit cell um, and you initialize your tensors all in a random way, then the optimization can be tricky that you can get trapped in some local minima. So that's why uh, it can get more tricky if you go to large unit cell size. I mean, it's the computation cost is linear in the unit cell size, but the optimization can become more tricky if you have more, more tensors in your unit cell. Why, why is the one tips of Plato so fragile in particular against uh, the it's, it's, it's a good question. I mean, the nice thing, uh, the continuation of the work would really be to study the anisotropic interactions in the shastri sutherland model, like the geologinsky marie interaction, in a more systematic way and see what happens. I mean, in the end, this was just based on the, on the simulation mm -hmm. which you observed. So I, mm -hmm. I don't, have, okay. don't have the intuition why it's really the one phase mm -hmm. plateau that is uh, first disappeared. But it would really be interesting to look at, into this in more, uh, in more detail. Because I think, so in the end, I think that's the way to go. If you want to get a better understanding of the material, mm -hmm. you don't need to really push to larger bond dimensions, but really get mm -hmm. to a better uh, description of your model. I mean, that's a, right. So in, in that case, it, it, this has a, a, a bigger effect than pushing the simulations to even larger bond dimensions. Mm -hmm. Do you have an understanding why the B equals to 2 variation noise is better than the blah phase? Uh, so, as already briefly mentioned yesterday in my talk, it turns out that the full update fails to provide you the most optimal um, uh, PEPs. So this, the full update is, a, is an optimal truncation, but the whole procedure in the end somehow fails to give you the most optimal uh, PEPs for a given bond dimension. Whereas if, of course, if you do a brute force minim energy minimization, it will really give you if you only have a few parameters, it will really give you the optimal uh, PEPs. And this really reflects the fact that the full update is kind of limited in, uh, in precision. So why full update fail to give you the best energy? Is that the intrinsic reason? Yeah, I mean, I will, I will talk about the optimization uh, tomorrow as well, but the, the problem is really, so you see, uh, the way we do the full update is to apply uh, an imaginary time evolution gate to two sides, yeah. and then truncate the bond of these two sides in an optimal way by, in, by including the yeah. entire 2D wave function, right? Yes. But we do this optimization just for this single bond, and once we have done this optimization, we replace all the tensors everywhere in our ansatz again. Right? So we, do, we optimize for one bond, but which is then afterwards copied everywhere in the ansatz. So it's not clear that doing the optimization for a single bond will be the optimal solution for the wave function where each, uh, all the tenses have been replaced. And I think this is, the, this is the main problem, but it could also, I mean, there could be other reasons as well, that, uh, that just doing these very small steps somehow, or maybe that they can, that you get stuck somewhere or something. So that there can be several reasons for that. Yeah. 